I'm going to make a quick flyby here of a few pieces of software to give a demonstration of some of these um, tools. Speaking here about what's called the frequency domain, and we can examine and look at the frequency domain by simply turning it on. Now here is a picture of a sound and the, the image that you're seeing is the energy distributed in frequency across the bottom low end spectrum all the way up to 15,000 Hertz. So this view of sound is informative because it tells us something about noise. We recognize that it's noise and we learn that noise is a saturation of energy across the entire hearing spectrum. So, so let's go back to our noise signal and let's isolate a single frequency out of it. So here we can see that we've isolated a single band and we begin to perceive something very different which is the notion of a tone. Now that we have a view of the limits of the human auditory system, we can begin to create bridges between the notion of an individual frequency or tone all the way to uh, the broadband noise spectrum. So a single tone, a single sine wave produces one frequency, but these frequencies can be combined into complex waveforms that have different characteristics. And one of the key characteristics might be harmonicity versus inharmonicity. So harmonic waveforms have special uh, low order ratios that bind them together with their fundamental frequency or lowest frequency. So this is very common to all things like pluck string instruments or, or um, blown wind instruments. You can see here a complex waveform with many components yet all working together, fused into a common fate as a tone. If we distort the ratios of these partials, we end up with something quite different, and it no longer functions as a musical scale, at least in the Western sense. So, so actual physical material and properties have a lot to do with the way music has been organized through the centuries. Now we've looked at some of the basic concepts of the limits of human hearing, noise, signal, frequency, uh, harmonicity and inharmonicity, and we can use some another tool to practice our audition, our hearing. So we'll choose a sound. So in this sound, we can see it's very complex, as all sound that is used for music is. And yet, now that we have some compass, we can begin thinking about, is it noisy? Yes. Is it inharmonic? It appears to be. Is it purely harmonic? No. So we can make some choices. We can submit that answer, and we can say, yes, we can learn some things about inharmonic sounds. We can do another one. Now this is the human voice. The human voice is a harmonic uh, resonating system, so we would automatically know that this is harmonic. Harmonic sounds need to resonance or sustain. There's a strong fundamental frequency, etc., etc. So this is a tool that we use to uh, uh, in the laboratory for students to learn about these basic concepts. Once we've covered all the basic concepts, we get closer to the actual stuff of music. What are sounds made of? Now we understand that they're more than just tones or pitches, and there's more than just harmony and rhythm. Uh, that we have to deal with in music. 
challenges and games of different sort to actually get much closer to music. So in this case, we're looking at a 2D space, a navigable space, in which each of these little circles represents a sound. And they've been placed in a special way now, that is, the puzzle has been solved, but when a student sees this, they're basically given the challenge. So the answer is, without knowing the question, So what we see here is that there are three groups of timbres or sound colors. There's a piano-like sound, there's a marimba sound, which is a wooden mallet instrument, and then there are bells. These are the actual Sather bells of uh, UC Berkeley, by the way. They've been arranged in frequency from low to high. They've been arranged in timbre uh, from the inharmonic to the harmonic in different ways. So we can see here that students can grab sounds and and then create a mix and compare. Of course we can always refer to the uh, sonogram analysis that um, is available for all of the pieces of software that we use in this course. Now for the next stage of the course we begin to apply everything that we've learned about sound to pieces of music. Notice with this tool that I can swim around through different markers in the sound file and each of these markers has been texted and is displayed so it allows the student to examine and study a piece of music backwards and forwards and then listen through. At the same time this provides an, a, an assessment tool for the students who are given a piece of music and asked to lay in their own markers in their own text and create a basic sound uh, analysis essay using the terminology of the course and an expanded notion of music. Of course music extends beyond just listening and we want to play music and we want to get our hands on sound now that we understand the nature of so much about music, we can begin to build our own instruments, and we do so in this course with virtual instruments that uh, students can play. So here's a virtual harp. The harp can be tuned and studied in different ways. It can be formed and and performed with use of probabilities for each of the strings and from this we begin to understand something about tone profiles the idea that scales are not just simply a bunch of notes packed into a set but that they have weights and measures and that if you understand those weights and measures you begin to understand something very deeply about musical material very quick, very quick overview of just a few of the pieces of software that I use in teaching my course Music Now at UC Berkeley. My name is Ed Campion and if you're interested in knowing more about the rest of the software or even downloading it for your own use, all of the pieces of software are available on standalone applications for Macintosh and Windows computer. Thanks for your time.